And uh, to our next panel, we will talk, uh, who will be a section that examines how the interests, uh, how the interests of science and art intersect in landscape painting in most of 19th century. And um, to talk specifically about the impact of Alexander von Humboldt's writings that compelled artists to travel and to explore and depict the remotest regions uh, of the hemisphere, we have two, here two scholars that will discuss um, two different artists that were impacted by Alexander von Humboldt's um, the theories. So I don't know if you noticed, but I'm wearing my tropical shirt which is like my humble homage to uh, this extraordinary scientist. Uh, so to join me in this uh, section, I uh, will invite Jennifer Robb to come to the table. And Jennifer is an assistant professor in the Department of History of Art at Yale University. Come, 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 come. <laughs> Don't let me here alone, please. <laughs> Um, so she's an assistant professor at the Department of Art History of Art at Yale University. And also to join me here, uh, Pablo Diner, my, uh, my colleague and friend, who is Chilean, uh, but Brazilian by adoption. <laughs> Um, first, uh, I think the first one, ladies first, of course, so Jennifer will begin the panel talking about Frederick Church, which uh, that is uh, the artist that's the subject of a book he, she just launched 10 days ago, right, Jennifer? So she's very proud to, and she has here a book to show you. <laughs> so um, Jennifer uh, teaches courses in American art and history of photography, uh, his, her first book on Frederick Church has just been launched, and recent co publications have considered history painting and the aesthetics of mapping the visual culture of American Civil War and then Flavin's collection of 19th century drawings. So please well, uh, join me to welcome Jennifer Robb. Thank you so much, Valeria. Um, this has just been so fantastic and thought-provoking, especially the, the, the morning papers, and so inspiring to be here, and my thanks uh, to just uh, uh, lend my voice again to the, the multitude of thanks that have already been given, but to the curators of this really just remarkable exhibition. It took me hours to get through just the first few rooms, and I need many more days here. <laughs> and uh, to the Terra Foundation, and of course the museum uh, that we're all enjoying being at here today, Crystal Bridges. Okay. Unlike many of his contemporaries, Frederick Church did not go to Europe as a young man. He did not embark on the grand tour of European capitals, or study in one of the esteemed art academies. He was not seduced by Rome when he later visited the Eternal City, despite this ravishing oil study I'm showing you. The city was, he wrote the painter Martin Johnson Heed, crowded with bad and indifferent artists. <laughs> the Alps, that revered subject of generations of European landscape painters, a mountain range nearly synonymous with the sublime, disappointed him. They have nothing, he wrote to another friend, which is not vastly exceeded by the Andes and lack many important features which make the Andes wonderful and exclusive. Church began his artistic education with Thomas Cole, but one could say that he found his own artistic vision in the Andes. In 1853, when he was 27, the painter chose an unusual path to follow the footsteps of scientists to South America. Inspired by the journeys of the great Prussian naturalist Alexander von Humboldt and by Charles Darwin's subsequent voyages on the Beagle, Church traveled through Ecuador and Colombia for nearly seven months. Upon his return, he, the artist painted his largest and most ambitious canvas to date, the Andes of Ecuador, which you're looking at here. In 1857, Church returned to his beloved Andes for a shorter trip and two months later produced The Heart of the Andes, 
arguably the most famous painting in the United States at mid-century. In the next decade, he would travel to the Canadian Arctic, the Caribbean, the Middle East, and finally, Europe. During his most itinerant period of the 1850s and 60s, he explored the ecological extremes of multiple continents. He produced on his voyages thousands of sketches. These constituted the first act in the creation of his so-called great pictures. Large-scale composite paintings like the Heart of the Andes advertised here that were displayed alone for an admission fee, attracting crowds of viewers as they toured the United States and often Europe. His major works were grounded in close observation and careful study, and such works were acclaimed for their attention to the specificities of the natural world. And such attention was required of the viewers as well, as you can see here, it says visitors are requested to bring opera glasses, uh, an optical strategy that immersed the spectators in the picture's details. But Church was also criticized increasingly as the century continued for a blinding love of detail. The canvases were, for many, too scientific. It is not enough that his ferns and climbers should be recognized by the tropical botanist, Church's own student, William James Stillman, declared. In other words, nature should be a metaphor for something larger than itself. Today, I want to consider the landscapes that both shaped and tested Church's approach to painting, from the Andes, if not Tierra del Fuego, to the Arctic. Looking closely at these two canvases, the Heart of the Andes of 1859 and the Icebergs of 1861, that most compellingly reveal his aesthetic as well as scientific concerns. Church voraciously read the work of scientists, including Humboldt's narrative of his travels through the Americas and his multi-volume masterwork, Cosmos, in which he specifically addresses landscape painters, encouraging them to travel to the tropics and directly observe nature to enrich their art. By looking past Europe's familiar terrain, those tired Alps, to the tropics, landscape painters could, quote, seize on the true image of the varied forms of nature. Humboldt's true image was not only a transcription of natural facts. It was, to use his words again, nature as a harmony, blending together all created things, however dissimilar in form and attributes, end quote. Although Humboldt recommended that painters pa make many plein air sketches, of individual botanical and geological forms. He also encouraged them to create more elaborately finished pictures upon returning to their studios, works reflective of Im imaginative breadth and, quote, the suppression of all unnecessary detail. Such suppression is found in the golden light that pervades Church's first Andean painting, The Andes of Ecuador. The sun's white orb is placed in the top center of the picture, a pupil-like form that actually appears at eye level. Its light dominates the canvas by forming a cruciform shape, extending horizontally over the mountaintops and vertically down the center of the picture, illuminating the distant winding streams, the central misty gorge, and the grassy plateau in the foreground. The painting provides a multitude of foreground details, but emphasizes effect, that blending together of all created things. For viewers, such wholeness had an inherently spiritual connotation, and critics at the time interpreted the painting this way. It literally floods the canvas with celestial fire, one wrote, and beams with glory like a sublime psalm of light, end quote. This light veils the foreground details, consumes the broad swath of sky, and nearly obliterates the mountain peaks in the distance. We see celestial light before terrestrial details. 
In the Andes of Ecuador, science is still subject to the sublime. If the Andes of Ecuador is Humboldt's painting, the heart of the Andes is Darwin's. Whereas the 1855 picture presents a cohesive cosmological narrative, the larger 1859 canvas constantly tests, however unintentionally, the limits of symbolic order. The heart of the Andes is a landscape of expansive optical competition. But Church undoubtedly intended quite the opposite effect. It was supposed to be a stunning homage to Humboldt, a catalog of botanical and geological and meteorological wonders, all part of one great cosmos. Church had hoped to ship the massive canvas, which measures more than five and a half by nearly 10 feet, to Germany so that the 89-year-old Humboldt could see it. But the scientist died just before these plans could become a reality, and the heart of the Andes never went to Berlin. That same year, 1859, The Origin of Species was published. Humboldt's concept of nature, what he called one great whole animated by the breath of life, would come to seem like a beautiful but impossible vision. With a seemingly endless proliferation of natural details, the heart of the Andes projects a sense of exuberant disorder. This is exactly what one feels in reading Darwin. Each plant or mammal or mollusk is meticulously described, the result of countless hours of observation and study. The text is both precise and wide-ranging. But such a broad scope does not translate into an easily apprehensible unity. About natural selection, Darwin wrote, I can see no limit to the amount of change, to the beauty and infinite complexity of the co-adaptations between all organic beings. And this was the anxiety for Darwin's audience, not the existence of such complexity or contingency, but the fact that harmony was not the result. Here was a world driven by adaptations at the smallest level of life, rather than by an inherent impetus toward wholeness. Humboldt's cosmology was based on nature's infinite variety. This was the point of departure for both Darwin and for Church, an observational practice that privileged detail and a mode of representation on the page and on the canvas that evoked a sense of the staggering abundance of life. But the result was quite different than it was for Humboldt, not a cosmos that could be definitively mapped and known, but a system constantly in flux. Darwin's book and Church's canvas are both also founded on a certain kind of struggle, a struggle for survival in Darwin's theory of evolution, and a struggle for attention in Church's canvas. Where does one look first? What should one focus on? What is important and what is insignificant? And how can one be sure of the difference? The heart of the Andes has no declarative focal point. The sky is nearly filled with dense clouds and darkened mountaintops with the snow-covered peak of Chimborazo rising in the upper left corner. Shadows undulate across this space, giving the entire picture a dynamism and sense of temporality that contrasts with the eternal quality of the Andes of Ecuador, where that sun locks everything into place, both compositionally and symbolically. A path in the heart of the Andes extends out into the immediate foreground and offers a way into the painting, ending in a bright cross. But here the trail stops in a verdant mass of trees and climbing vines with no apparent continuation. The heart of the Andes includes an astounding array of flora and fauna. Two yellow butterflies, each with a black spot, and a bird that appears to be a male quetzal. These are the butterflies here, and here are the quetzal with uh, identifiable through those twin green tail feathers, that red uh, breast and the blue body. These all place near a dead tree where the artist has signed uh, the painting, reading 1859 F.E. Church on the tree there. 
At the bottom right corner of the painting, broad aroid leaves are pocked with insect bites and fan out in all directions. Branches cast a precise tangle of shadows on an exposed rock, and a morning glory vine with tiny violet blooms grows above it, right around here. And then there are, right below it, climbing red passion flowers with those tripartite leaves and long protruding filaments. And I actually asked a tropical uh, botanist to look at the painting with me and uh, tell, uh, tell me what he could identify, and that resulted in many very interesting emails filled with Latin names. Uh, a critic for the Ruskinian journal The Cran during the time addressed this profusion of specimens when the painting debuted. Every square inch of the canvas is covered with nature's statistics, he wrote, seeming to both complain and marvel. The picture was a sensation. Over a mere three-week period, 12 to 13,000 people paid their 25 cents to view it when it was first unveiled in an exhibition hall on Broadway in New York. The picture was shown alone in an elaborately carved black walnut shadow box frame, the same frame shown here in a later photograph, surrounded by swags of jewel-toned fabric and strikingly illuminated. Booklets were published about the painting, poems written, sermons given, and even a musical score, a march by George Warren composed in its honor. And this is uh, the, the, the picture of the, uh, on the, the sheet music. And I can assure you that Warren's homage to the heart of the Andes is not at all Andean. Um, it has this kind of up-tempo pace and boisterous chords and this forceful and very often repeated refrain um, that gives it a kind of unapologetic bombast that I think is kind of characteristic of, of marches and processionals composed in the United States uh, during that time. In 1864, during the American Civil War, Church's South American picture was exhibited with a, an explicit sense of national purpose. At the Metropolitan Fair in New York, a benefit to raise money for injured Union soldiers, the Heart of the Andes was displayed below three presidential portraits, and we have John Adams, George Washington, and Thomas Jefferson. With the Founding Fathers positioned above, that is, to the north of Church's South American landscape, and swaths of rich fabric draped around the four paintings, a broader union seems to be suggested. Manifest destiny, that notion of the divinely ordained westward expansion of the United States, is here extended south. The north, signified by a triad of male luminaries, exists as part of the south, Church's Andean painting. A jungle of botanical specimens are brought under the gaze of the founding fathers as if to incorporate the tropics into the history of the United States or to colonize them. The presidential portraits exert a kind of pressure on the heart of the Andes. They loom above it, weighing it down by imposing a patriotic discourse, bringing the profusion of tropical details into a clear paternal uh, lineage. The south, United, the south of the United States and the Southern Hemisphere are conjoined but carefully subordinated to historical patriarchy. With enveloping swags of fabric and presidents presiding, the South is brought back into the fold in the Metropolitan Fair's wartime installation. Three years earlier, in 1861, just days after the first shots of the Civil War had been fired, Church debuted a painting provocatively entitled The North. But the picture itself ignores the political illusions of the title, offering no visual reference to the conflict between the states, nor any invitations to read this polar landscape, which Church had sketched during a trip along the Newfoundland and Labrador coasts as a patriotic manifesto. Many viewers were baffled by the painting's emptiness. One critic warned the public that the picture would, quote, follow them home and haunt them for weeks. The canvas proved popular with audiences, but it did not sell. So in 1863, before the painting was shipped to London for exhibition, the artist decided to change the title and the composition itself. The North became the icebergs, and a broken ship's mass was added to the foreground. So you can kind of 
<laughs> put your hand in front and see how it would have looked before the ship's mast in the foreground there was added, this sort of one sign of humanity in an otherwise barren landscape. The addition of the cross-like wreckage indicates Church's desire to make the painting cohere around an allegorical message or an intelligible story of the heroism and tragedy of exploration. But rather than bringing order to the painting, this detail diagnoses the difficulty of constructing such order. The mast points to a narrative or a series of narrative possibilities that always remain elusive. Church presumably added the mass before the painting's London debut for two main reasons, to alleviate the emptiness that American critics had found difficult, and to reference Arctic exploration, which had particular resonance with the British. Adding a mast was a means to create a more legible and more marketable painting. The most famous Arctic explorer was undoubtedly Sir John Franklin, and although Church is careful not to give his mast uh, the marks of any particular expedition, it seems logical that British viewers would have thought first of Franklin. With two ships and 128 men, the explorer had set out to navigate a northwest passage, a more direct route between Europe and Asia through the Arctic, in May 1845. After three years without word from the expedition, rescue missions were dispatched. Franklin's fame and promises of monetary awards kept the disappearance of the explorer's fleet in the public eye for decades, with hopes of finding the official expedition records or even survivors living among the Inuit. Instead, evidence of cold, starvation, disease, and even cannibalism surfaced. It became clear that all had perished, but few clues were found. The mast in the icebergs is the relic that was never discovered. The eye first moves to these splintered pieces of wood, and the canvas now seems to be adamantly about something. The idea of exploration, a tribute to a real person, the memory of an actual journey. But the mast most convincingly and paradoxically references disappearance of a commander, his ships, his crew, and their hopes for new discoveries and later basic survival. It also represents the act of speculation in response to such disappearance. In the wake of death and uncertainty, the mast is like the small tentative tale that aims to reassure by constructing a means to remember. The mast is a cross-like gravestone that makes the whiteness less threatening, as if a story that ended in death were more comforting than emptiness. Church's masthead does not chart a clear optical course through the rest of the painting. It literally points to the grotto area across the canvas, across to this area, and is also connected by that repetition of both the brown and bright aquamarine colors. The mass position initially seems like a clear directive, sort of there, that pointing. Uh, but we are redirected away from the only signs of humanity, the mast, and next to it, the artist's signature on a slab of ice, to an eerie green space of ghostly submerged icebergs. It's hard to figure out the scale of this grotto area and the distance between it and the mast. Instead of moving from foreground to middle ground to background through the center of the picture following landscape convention, the painting makes a sharp turn, pointing away from the looming iceberg in the middle of the canvas to the strangeness of an icy grotto. There is a wealth of possible symbolism here. The brown boulder and glacial formations might reference geological time. Debates about erratic boulders, those huge, oddly placed rocks that dot the earth, had provoked a rethinking of geological history during the mid-19th century, and scientists proposed competing theories, a great flood or an ice age, to explain these boulders and glaciers. The grotto formation, meanwhile, can be read as a more mythological element or romantic trope, and here you're looking at a few of Joseph Wright of Darby's late 18th century paintings depicting grottos. 
According to the London Daily News, Church's own grotto could be the, quote, haunt of fairies or some lovely sirens, while the London Review imagined hiding places for the mermaids. Others described Parthenons and Peter's domes and Byzantine columns. Critics found the painting difficult to articulate, and thus they most often turned to figurative language and ekphrastic description to fill the gap. From mast to boulder and grotto, our eyes move next to the largest iceberg. The boulder, like the mast, even seems to point to this central iceberg. The rock looks like a cannon, the barrel of the gun tapering as it faces the pyramid of white ice. The iceberg may dwarf the grotto and boulder with its monumental size and stature, but the course that we take to reach it divests it of much of its power. It blocks our view of the horizon and our knowledge of what lies beyond. The shadows on the central iceberg seem to indicate that the sun must be located to the left, but the play of reflections and refractions between water, ice, and sky make locating the sun's precise position impossible. Visual transcendence, a movement into the heavens beyond, is denied by a large mass of white paint, a surface both blank and exquisitely detailed with every chip, crack, and fissure, shaded with blues and purples and pinks to create a color akin to bruised porcelain. A dome tops the iceberg, nearly disappearing into the sky, this dome here that you see. And I think it recalls that round ornamentation of Thomas Cole's castle in the clouds in the painting entitled Youth from his Voyage of Life series, with all which allegorizes the brash confidence of the young and of a young nation in pursuing grand visions. The castle is a fantastical projection in Cole's painting. In Church's work, the white form is about material substance, about the effects of time and atmosphere on matter, and about rendering this in paint. The iceberg becomes its own canvas, a white painting within a painting. If there is a dramatic arc created by moving from mass to grotto to boulder, the central iceberg, the painting's namesake, absorbs any narrative momentum into whiteness. Neither the smooth face of the berg nor its countless sharp edges offer legible significance. The final move of the painting assures this. Without a focal point like the sun in the Andes of Ecuador, we are pushed back to the left foreground where we began. The entire left edge of the canvas is consumed by a wall of ice which creates a sense of visual entrapment and at five feet, four and a half inches high actually replicates our own vertical form. The addition of the mass to address the painting's lack of narrative direction, in fact, makes the picture more boldly unclear. The instability of this single detail begins a journey that leads us away from easy interpretations, that ends with a boundary that cannot be crossed or overcome. The mast added in 1863 indicates an absence that moves beyond simple signification, a piece of a lost ship, to point to a more profound and unsettling sense of disappearance that the rest of the painting constructs. There is a startling lack of sentiment or drama. This is not a romantic homage to a fallen hero. In the icebergs, nature is not the stage for God's grand and moralizing gestures, as in Sir Edwin Lancier's not-so-subtle contemporaneous work, but wonderful nevertheless, Man Proposes, God Disposes, or Caspar David Friedrich's The Sea of Ice of 1823, which, with its bold, triangular composition, monumentalizes loss and confronts us with the power and the order of the natural world. Those elements that would seem typical of romantic painting, the grottos in Rite of Darby or the shipwreck in Friedrich, are made smaller but more problematic, quieter but more disturbing in the icebergs. Church's details signal a turn toward a scientific realism and a movement away from the allegorizing impulses of romanticism. 
Details are very often not assimilated into a whole in church's landscapes. And this presented a challenge to the dominant aesthetics of landscape painting. The details, the prose of nature he should omit, wrote Ralph Waldo Emerson in his essay entitled Art, referring to the landscape painter. A landscape painting, Emerson continued, should give us only the spirit and splendor. Yet the splendor of Church's paintings is their details. These two powerful landscapes, south and north, exhibited as this advertisement here on the left states, at the same moment in New York City in 1861, were each the product of the artist's far-reaching travels throughout the Americas, each deeply invested in scientific discourses and discoveries, each an exploration of what a painting that refuses to omit the details, that privileges those details above all, might look like. The detail conveys art at its greatest proximity and often at its most strange and unfamiliar. The poet Elizabeth Bishop describes this experience in one of her letters. Reading Darwin, she writes, one admires the beautiful solid case being built up out of his endless heroic observations, almost unconscious or automatic. And then comes a sudden relaxation, a forgetful phrase, and one feels the strangeness of his undertaking, sees the lonely young man, his eyes fixed on facts and minute details, sinking or sliding giddily off into the unknown. Through detail, empiricism is wed to epiphany. To see in detail is to pursue knowledge, only to discover instead the beautiful strangeness of seeing. Thank you.